Okay, let's talk about a kind of interesting tool that uh, Weka has. I haven't seen this in too many data science software tools, but let's try and take a look at this called the Boundary Visualizer file. Let's go to the data. And he has a special Iris data set here. It's the, he calls it Iris 2D. If I open it up in the Explorer, you can see that it only has two input variables and then the class. So he deleted the other two input variables. So we only have pedal length and pedal width. So it's a simplified version of the Iris data set. So we can see here in this uh, visualization, uh, boundary visualizer, it's, we've only got the pedal length and the pedal width. And the pedal length is shown along this axis in this boundary visualizer. And the pedal width is shown along this axis. And we still have the colors. So for the classes, so red is iris setosa, so they're here. And green is iris versicolor, and they're here. And blue is iris virginica, and they're up here. So from this picture, you can see that when petal length and petal width are small, it's usually going to be a iris setosa. And it, when they're kind of in the middle range, it's usually going to be an iris versicolor. And when they're large, it's usually going to be an iris virginica. So we can just see that with this display. But that, but that's not what this display is for, or that's not what this uh, tool is for. It's for understanding how different machine learning algorithms work, how they classify. So this is not, we haven't made any predictions yet. So we're just showing the data. Now, hopefully we'd like classifiers that would work very well so that like whenever we get something Iris setosa, it's going to classify it as an iris setosa. And whenever we get something that's an iris versicolor, it's going to classify it as an iris versicolor. But machine learning algorithms are not perfect, and they kind of divide up this whole space into what they think are going to be where the setosas are going to be, where the versicolors are going to be, and where the Virginicas are going to be. So they use this data to, to sort of try and come up with some kinds of rules that will divide this up. So in fact, let's go back and try out, let's go back and try out J48 on this data. This is only the two variable data, two input variable data. Let's try that. Let's try J48 on this. Let's see what J48 does. What J48 says is when pedal width is less than or equal to 0.6, always predict iris setosa. So going back to this picture, when pedal width, what does it say? Which one is pedal width? The y variable. So it says, whenever pedal width is less than 0.6, predict iris setosa. So here's the pedal width, and I guess 0.6 is somewhere around here. And so the rule says that no matter that if pedal width is less than this, always predict iris setosa. That's probably right, at least for this data, probably perfect, right? If you draw a line here, if this is 0.6, then probably if you say whenever it's below there, it's going to be an iris setosa. For this data set, it's going to be exactly or perfectly true. Okay, let's look at further what it says. Then it says, if pedal width is greater than 0.6, then check Actually, let's do this with this visualizing. I'm not so good at reading that. Let's try this. Okay, so here, if pedal width is less than 0.6, always choose or always say iris setosa. So again, pedal width less than 0.6 means here's pedal width, right? The y-axis is pedal width. So maybe this is about 0.6 because here's 0.1 and here's 2.5. 0 0.6 is probably around here. So this says whenever... Whenever it's less than 0.6, classify it as setosa, as, the, as red. Okay, now what does it say? What's the next part of the tree? So it says when pedal width is greater than 0.6, then check pedal width again. And if it's less than 0.7, check something else. But if it's greater than 0.7, then classify it as virginica. So if it's less than 1.7, 1.7 is here. So if it's 
greater than 1.7, then choose. So if it's greater than 1.7, then choose Iris virginica, which is the blue. Okay, so maybe 1.7 is somewhere around here. And so if it's greater than that, classify it as blue. Okay, that seems good now here. If it's less than 1.7, then check the, according to this algorithm, check the petal length. And if that is less than 0.49, so that's probably around here somewhere, then classify it as versicolor which is the green. Okay, maybe that makes sense. So what did we have if it's less than this and less than this? Then classify it as the green. Okay, so that's what the rule gives, and you sort of get a feeling for what it's, what's happening here. Now, if we want to see all of that, sort of how this rule is working in this petal width, petal length space, so to speak, we can use this so-called boundary visualizer. So let's try it. Let's try the J48 visualizer and let's see if we can sort of see what we just tried to see. So let's click this. Okay, so there it is. So let's click stop because it seems to keep doing this for a long time, but it's not gonna really change. So, okay, so it did stop by itself. I didn't click it yet. Okay, so this is sort of what we saw or let's see, let's see it here. So if the petal width is less, so this is how the J48 is thinking about the problem. So let's see how J48 is thinking about this problem. So if the, pe which is petal, the X axis is petal length, the Y axis is petal width. This is dealing with petal width, so it's the Y axis. So if the Y axis is less than 0.6, so I, this must be 0.6 here. So if the Y axis is less than 0.6, just always call it setosa, always make it red, always predict red. And also up here, let's look at this one. This is, comes from what? If pedal width, pedal width is greater than, here it is, if pedal, so we did pedal width is greater than 0.6, and then we check here, if pedal width is actually greater than 0 .1, 0 0.1.7, so that must be here. Then always assign it to Iris virginica. And that's what we see here. Always assign it to Iris. So no matter what the x-axis is, what the petal length is, no matter where all, it doesn't matter, we're always going to assign it to Iris virginica. Okay, so let's try and look at this. So here we have, first of all, let's just say the petal length is along the x-axis and the petal width is along the y-axis and one important value is 4.9 is right here and one important value for the y-axis is 1.5 which is here so that's the this, this height here and this is this length here first we have if the y-axis which is petal width if the y-axis is less than 0.6 so the y-axis less than 0.6, this is 0.6 here. So if the y-axis is less than 0.6, it's going to be iris setosa. It's going to be red. Iris setosa is red. And notice that this is independent of the petal length, independent of the y-axis. There's no specification about the y-axis here. It's just if the petal width is less than 0.6. So if the y-axis is less than 0.6, it doesn't say anything about the x-axis. It's always going to be red. So it's always red here. Okay, also the same thing up here. It's always blue, independent of what the petal length is. Where is that? That is this one here. So this says if the y-axis petal width is greater than 0.6, and then it also jumps up, says what if the same thing, the y-axis is actually greater than 1.7. So this right here is 1.7. So if it's greater than 1.7, then it just says it's iris virginica. Notice that even though there are two specifications here, they really resolve to just this one specification. And notice there's no specification on the x-axis. So it's always the same. It's always, in this case, blue. So the range where it matters what the x-axis is, is between here, which we said was 1.7. That was This was up here, 1.7 
and this value here, which is this 0.6 over here. So if it's between, uh, if the y-axis is less than 1.7 and greater than 0.6, then it's going to depend on the x-axis. So where's that? So here, if the y-axis is greater than 0.6 and less than 1.7, so greater than 0.6 and less than 1.7, so that brings us to here, then we check the x-axis. So what are we going to say? If the x-axis is less than 4.9, it's always going to be green, which is versicolor. So let's see, if the x-axis is less than 4.9, it's always going to be green. It's always going to be here. On the other hand, if the x-axis, we're still in this region here, or this, the y variable is between here and here, but now we're checking the x-axis. If the x-axis, which is the petal length, is greater than 4.9, so that's down this axis here, then we have two situations. One is it could be verse color green, or it could be virginica blue, and that depends on now what is it once we're in this region and we're in this region then it depends on the y-axis again then it depends on the pedal width so it splits on pedal width and if it's less than 1.5 it's iris virginica that's the blue but if it's greater than 1.5 here's 1.5 then it's going to be the green iris virginica now i kind of object to the way that they color this because this should be just green it shouldn't be sort of a, a bluish shade of green because it's not sort of versicolor, it is versicolor. Now, one thing I didn't, I forgot to stress is that this data set only has two independent variables. It only has, remember, we whittled it down. It was originally the iris data set has four independent variables or input variables, pedal width, pedal length, sepal length, and sepal width. But we, we threw those out, and so we only are dealing with these two. Now, we could have left them in and then just selected these two. There's a setting up, up at the top where you select which variables you want to picture. But anyway, he just selected these two, or rather, he just he, he got rid of the other one, so he didn't even have to choose these two. They were, these were the only two. But you could look at other ones and see how it splits up according to other variables as well. I guess he probably did that because he wants the tree only to contain these variables because he's only going to show two variables at a time in this picture. So he wants only two variables to show up in the tree. So maybe that's why he split, uh, he eliminated certain variables. Okay, let's try one uh, R and see what that does. How does it divide up this space? By the way, how well does this uh, J48 do with this classification scheme? It does very well, 96%. And that's basically because these variables, these variables cluster the classes extremely well. So when we look at these two variables, if we say that the x-axis is less than here and the y-axis is less than here, it's nearly, I guess it's perfect, that they're all red. And in here, we can also, they're also very separated. The classes are very well separated by these variables. If we had chosen different variables, we may not get this kind of separation. So then J48 wouldn't have done so well if we had only two other variables. But we have here these two variables. These two variables work very well for giving us the class. Maybe the other variables don't work as well. Maybe they do, but maybe they don't. Okay, anyway, let's see how 1R does with this data. So we go to 1R, which is part of the rules, 1R, and let's click Start. Okay, so remember, the, whole, the idea of 1R is that it just chooses one variable to make the classification. So it, it checks to see which variable is better, but then it only chooses one variable to make the classification. So what variable did it choose? Like you could, you should be able to see, should be able to tell by looking at this picture what variable it chose. Well, here there's only two variables to choose from, pedal length and pedal width, and which variable does it split the class on? We can see that it's this variable. So when the class, 
when it's between here and here, one R will predict red or predict iris setosa. When this variable is between here and here, one R will predict iris versicolor, green. And when this variable is above here, then it will predict blue. So which variable is this? Which variable did it choose? This is the y-axis, so it chose petal width. So it chose petal width. Now, is that true? Let's check. Let's go here and look at what 1R actually does. So go to the rules here and check it and run it. And let's see what it did. So here's the, the rule, and you can see that the rule is it works on petal width. Let's make sure that's right. The x-axis, sorry, the y-axis we said, that's petal width. So you can see that it does decide based on, remember, it's only going to use one, one R only uses one variable, and it's going to, in this case, it decided to use petal width, which is the y-axis. And what does it say in this? It says, if petal width is less than 0.8, that must be here, then classify it as iris setosa, that's the red. Okay, if it's, if it's less than 1.75, so if it's not less than 1.8, but it is less than 1.75, then versicolor, that's the green, and then otherwise it's the blue, which is the virginica. Okay, so we can see how 1R partitions the space as well. Okay, by the way, that's the word that we used when we were talking about naive Bayes. And when we were talking about Bayes' theorem, we talked about something called a partition, a partition of a set. This is a partition of a set, right? So that's uh, the same concept, actually. So we can say that the machine learning algorithm partitions a space and shows us the class associated with different partitions. Now, what if 1R had chosen the other variable instead of pedal width, it had decided that pedal length had been better then we would have gotten vertical bars here, not horizontal bars. Okay, now let's check. We talked about K nearest neighbor. Let's try that one. So let's see what that looks like. But before we do that, let's think about how it's going to work. So the idea is, suppose that we have a dot right here. So what is K nearest neighbor going to classify this as? Well, it looks for the nearest neighbors and it's going to classify according to what's happening near to this point. So if we had a dot right here, the closest dots are all red, so it's going to classify this dot as red. Now we could change the K and N, the number of neighbors to consider. We could change it to two, three, four, five, and then it would look for the, the we had this to be four, then it would choose the four nearest neighbors and make a decision based on that, or let's say three. We had three, it would choose the three nearest neighbors. I'm not going to do that. But if it was three, then even still, if I had a dot right here, the close, the three closest dots are all red, so it's going to call it red. If I move it here, still the three closest dots are red, so it's going to call a dot here red. If I put it here, if I had a dot here, the three closest are all red, so it's going to call it red. But let's go back to just the, the closest. Let's use k equals just one, not three. Still. The closest one is red, so it's going to classify this as red. Now, as I start to move closer and closer to this area over there, the green area, then it's going to, it's going to change. So eventually, when I get like to here, then the closest neighbor to this point would be green. So it's going to classify this dot here as green. So somewhere between here and here, it's going to have to switch from green, from red to green. Like if I go right here, then I guess the closest red one is here, and the closest green one is here. And when I move over to here, so that's what that's the way it works. So when I'm over here, what's the closest dot? Probably green. So this is going to be green. And here, probably still the closest dot is green, and so on. And same thing up here. And then when I start to move in this direction, then it might become blue. So it's going to, you can sort of see, what it's going to do, it's going to classify things to the left of this line here is going to be red, everything to the, then we're going to start to be green, and then there's going to be another line like here, 
and to the right of that it's going to be blue. So that's what we should expect. Let's see. So that is what k nearest neighbors, how it kind of divides up the space. So like we said, it goes here from red to green and then from green to blue. Now what is this going on here? And this is a little bit strange. For example, if we choose this to be like five and run it again, let's just do that. Yeah, I have the same problem with this display as I mentioned with the other one, where you have this is clearly red, but this is sort of red, but it's not sort of red in terms of the algorithm, right? The algorithm either says it's going to be Setosa or Virgin or Versicolor. It doesn't say it's kind of Setosa and kind of Versicolor, but what it's doing here, the reason it's showing sort of red is that the nearest neighbors are mostly red, but not, there's some, if you have, what did we say? We, we chose the nearest neighbors. We chose five nearest neighbors. So maybe three of them, or maybe four of them are red, and one of them is green. So it, it's showing that balance. But as I said, that's a little bit misleading because in the end, it doesn't say it's kind of red. It says it's red. So it should be comp just red. But on the other hand, they're just trying to express the fact that maybe here, it's there's a kind of balance that it's, but it, it is choosing red, but there's some green in the list of nearest of five nearest neighbors. Now, if I go back to one and run it again, so we get this. Now, what is this here? Let me go back and open it. I don't know how to clear this display, so I'll just reopen the data set. So what is that? Oh, it's here. So there's some green and some red. So this kind of green, if it, like, so if it's here, it's going to be green. So that's why I guess this kind of, that green part popped into the red part, broke into the red part. Let's try that again. So that's why we got that shape. Okay, let's talk about something called bias, or maybe even bias variance, trade-off, but uh, specifically bias here. So imagine that you're playing darts and you want to hit the bullseye, which is here. You have four different types of players here. So this is one player, how they throw the darts. This is another player, how they throw the darts. This is another player, how they throw the darts. And this is the fourth player and how they throw the darts. We can talk about these two players here as having low variance in their dart throwing. So the variance means the spread of the data or the spread of the points or the spread of the locations of the darts. So for the two pictures on the left, the spread is quite low. So you can see that this person is throwing all to the same point or very close to the same point, especially compared to say this person or this person. And so is this person. So we talk about the variance of this one as very small as compared to this or as compared to this. And the variance of this one is also very small as compared to this or as compared to this. So to understand the bias, we talk about what would happen if we took the average of all of the points. So here, if we took the average of all of these points, there's going to be some distance between that average and the center. So that means there's some bias in this data. Here, again, if we took the average of all of these points, there's going to be some distance between that average and the center. And so we say this also has bias. Whereas here, even though there's some variance, if we took the average of all, position of all of these x's, it's going to be basically close to the center so we say this is unbiased or doesn't have bias or doesn't have much bias. And the same thing here. So if we took the average of all of these, it, it's going to be very close to the center as well. So that's how we understand the bias. So there is bias here and there is bias here because the average of all of these is not, there's some distance between that average and the center. And here, the average of all of these, of all of these there's also going to be some distance between that average and here.
However, we talk about this one as having a high bias, and this one is having a low bias. So this is a person maybe who has some problem with their vision, and they see, even though the center is here, they see the center over here, but they're actually a good player in the sense that they don't have a lot of variation. They're just some problem with their eye. So they're throwing basically at, uh, everything in the same place, but they're missing the spot. So we call the distance from here to here the bias. Bias is, is large here compared to here. The bias is very low. The distance from the center of this set of data and the actual center is quite large, whereas these are basically all right in the bullseye. Okay, now let's, let's compare this one. So here, this has quite a high variance but the bias is probably right here in the center. That is, if you take the center of all of these, it's probably somewhere in the bullseye area. So we would say that the bias is small here. So what we're talking about with the bias is the average of all of the dark positions and the distance or the difference between that and the actual bullseye. So here, the average of all these is probably somewhere in here or in the bullseye area, so the bias is small, whereas here the bias is large. And here also the bias is large because the average of all these is probably somewhere around here, so you have a large bias. This is also high variance, and this one is high variance but low bias, and this one is low bias and low variance. So that's one introduction to this concept of bias and also to the concept of variance. So we can say that the bias is the distance between the target and the actual data, or we can say it's the average distance between the target and the data. And using the caret to indicate the predicted value and thinking of the dart throwing as our estimator, the bias is the average of the dart position and the true value. Or we can say it's the average of f hat, that's the estimator, or the, remember the darts are kind of like the estimates that we're trying to make. So it's the average of f hat minus f. Or using the idea of the expected value, instead of average, it's the expected value of f hat minus F. So that's the bias. So if you're familiar with the statistical concept of expected value, which basically just means the average, the bias here is expected value of the, remember what does F hat mean? That's the estimation minus F means the true value. So we could use Y hat and Y just as easily. So we're talking about the deviation of the model from the actual true value. And if we go back to this picture here, say, or this one here, the predicted value is here and the true value is here. And the difference between those is the bias. And we can say it's sort of the, at, you take the average diff distance between this one and 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 this one. And this one and this one, that's how we can interpret the E or the expected value in that previous notation here. So in this picture, let's say this one here, uh, we can say that the error is some combination of the bias and the variance. So we can say that about all of these, but it's easiest to see here. So the error, which is the uh, how far we are from the bullseye, is some combination of the bias. So this has a bias, uh, this has a center somewhere around here, and it has a certain amount of variation. So even if we had unbiased estimates, then it could be like this, there'd still be some error involved, as opposed to this, we might say there's very, very low error here. But um, so we can say that the error is some combination of the bias and the variance. 
So we could sort of call the bias systematic error because it's always, the estimates are always off by a certain amount. And then we can talk about the variance is non-systematic error. There's nothing systematic about it. It could be in any place. So we could talk about the bias, though, as systematic error. Now, in data science, the framework is slightly different, but we're going to say, so what is what do we mean by bias? Bias is the are the simplifying assumptions that are made by a model to make the target function easier to learn. So the target function means the true relationship that we're trying to model. That's called the target function or it's the target relationship. So it's what we've been, what we've talked about as the true relationship between the inputs and the output. And depending on the algorithm that we use, depending on the machine learning algorithm, whether it's 1R or J48 or regression or K nearest neighbor and so on, each of those models has makes some kind of assumptions and has some kinds of limitations in terms of how they can classify or make predictions. And each one has its own kind of limitations. And generally, we might say that low bias machine learning al algorithms include decision trees, K nearest neighbors, and we haven't studied them, but support vector machines. And examples of high bias machine learning algorithms include linear regression and some other ones that we haven't studied. Now, in terms of machine learning, the, the concept of variance, which we just saw with that picture, this picture here, well, how do we interpret this in terms of machine learning? So what we're gonna say is that each dot, each dart that we throw, which produces a dot, in the context of machine learning, that would be each new training set. Remember, the training set is a sample from the population, and we might choose different training sets, and so we will get different models based on the training set that we've chosen, right? We, we pick a training set, and then we get a model, but if we chose a different training set, we would get a different model. So the dots here, actually represent different models that we would get if we chose a new training set. So if we choose a new training set, we might get a, a model which is doesn't do a very good job of estimating what we're trying to estimate, which is the true relationship. So again, what is bias? Bias is this uh, are the simplifying assumptions made by a model to make the target function easier to learn so what is variance? Variance is the amount that the estimate of the target function, so our estimate of the model, which is all we have, we just make estimates of model. So the amount that those will change if we use different training data. So that's what we mean by variance in terms of machine learning. And examples of low variance machine learning algorithms include Linear regression, remember we said linear regression is high bias, but it's low variance. And examples of high variance machine learning algorithms are decision trees like J48, K nearest neighbors, and support vector machines. So what does this have to do with what we've been talking about with the boundary visualizer? So let's, let's run it again. Let's use, first let's go back to 1R, and let's run it. Okay, so we see that in this case, 1R is going to break the instance space, the set of all the instances, is going to try and classify them, and it's going to do this by breaking the instance space up into bands. So if we're stuck just with bands, then we have quite a bit of restriction or limitation in our modeling process. Whereas if we go to J48, we saw that we're not stuck with just bands. We could just have bands, but we can also break up each band into different sections. So we have less bias in J48, that is less restriction 
in the model in the way the model can actually break the space up with j48 than we do with 1r okay now let's go to k nearest neighbor which is here here and try that so now we have considerably less bias less limitation we can even get shapes like this with k nearest neighbor whereas we can't get anything like that with j48 so this algorithm has a lot less bias or limitation than j48 or 1r so we can say that that boundary visualizer enables us to visualize the limitations of the different models or the bias of different models.